really quickly, I'll introduce myself. My name is Patrick Jones. I'm the program director uh, for the Monterey Clinic. Um, I'm a therapist by trade. I uh, spent a lot, a lot of time working with the military, um, some private practice, some methadone, suboxone clinics a long time ago. Um, <clears throat> and now here I am in this uh, role as the program director. I uh, would like for this talk to be less of me talking into the screen and more of a discussion. Those of you that have uh, seen some of my, my talks, I I prefer to be very interactive. So hopefully um, you all will be asking questions. Feel free to interrupt me. You will not hurt my feelings. Um, I, I find that as a, a, a term of endearment if you interrupt me. Um, <clears throat> if you're asking good questions uh, and being appropriate. So, and usually I ask people, I say, hey, um, are there any neuroscientists or anybody that has a understanding of neurology beyond, you know, uh, a high school or maybe an early college level uh, so I can figure out who I'm talking to, okay? Um, we're gonna talk about neurology and um, what happens in our brain with addiction and, I am not going to be 100% uh, accurate from a medical perspective. I'm, I'm more trying to give you um, an understanding of how alcohol and drugs impacts the brain. And it's not going to be like the, um, you know, the frying pan and the egg kind of, this is your brain on drugs. Uh, but that commercial did shape my life and many other uh, people born in the 80s. So... Um, let's go ahead and jump into this. So, um, Monterey, can you, can you confirm that you got the, uh, slideshow up on your screen? You guys are going to be my go-to. Um, I know I could hear you. Okay. Thanks. All right. So your brain on drugs and alcohol, um, insert frying pan, uh, commercial there, um, presented by myself. Um, so, I'm going to go through really quickly uh, and just talk about some key concepts and terms. I'm going to flow quickly in this so that we can get to the part where I'm doing some drawing and uh, really kind of illustrating what's going on. Um, so some key concepts and terms. So the first one, we're addiction, okay? Um, and just being really, uh, my favorite uh, definition of addiction comes from this biopsychosocial model where addiction is the result of a dynamic interplay of individuals' genetic makeup, psychological um, characteristics, and social environment, biopsychosocial. Um, today, we're going to be looking in the biological aspect. Um, the next lecture that I do, we'll be talking about the psychological aspect, okay? <clears throat> homeostasis. Um, this is the point where I say, does anybody know what homeostasis means? Um, but I already put the definition up there for you. Um, any self-regulating process by biological systems that tend to maintain stability of that system, okay? Tolerance, we're gonna talk about tolerance today. Um, hey, uh, Melanie, you get, you look like you got your, uh, your audio work in there. Melanie, tell me what tolerance is. You don't have to put your video on, but you can just, uh, you can just do the audio. I guess I'm just not going to ask questions. Our procedures and our equipment, quite frankly, to ensure that something like Okay. All right. So tolerance. That is our ability to use more of a substance um, and have a decreased uh, effect on our bodies. Okay. We get that through time. Withdrawal. Withdrawal is when we um, stop using a substance and our body um, rejects that place without uh, having a substance on board. And usually the withdrawal effects are the opposite of the uh, effect of the substance, okay? Well, I'll show you how that happens in the brain. Relapse, everybody's familiar with what a relapse is. We'll talk about that and, and how the brain reacts to that. Substance dependence and substance abuse. Uh, the DSM doesn't call it that anymore, right? They call it substance use disorder, mild, moderate, and severe, and severe with physiological uh, dependence. Now, I still like to say dependence and abuse. 
Um, it's just kind of easier to say it that way. We'll talk about how the brain looks in both of those situations. The saying, once a pickle, always a pickle, okay? Um, that's an old AA saying, and we're gonna talk about that and, and, and what that means in the brain. Um, and we're also gonna talk about what is a new normal. And um, we'll, we'll, I'll show you how the brain kind of gets to that new normal uh, as it heals itself through um, recovery. And then uh, we're gonna talk about um, this idea of the threshold theory. And I put there, it's a choice until it's not. So a lot of people will argue, um, oh, addiction is just a choice. Just choose to stop drinking. And that might be true um, for the person that has not crossed their threshold. And I'll show you that. I'll explain that to you uh, when we start drawing here in a second. So uh, this is just a quick image of the biopsychosocial model of addiction, um, biological genetics, um, psychological, emotion, behaviors, uh, social, obviously everything um, in our environment, also trauma. And you can see how they're all interconnected. So what I'm talking to you today uh, about today is, is not all inclusive. Addiction is not a simple thing like I, I break my arm, I put it in a cast, but the cast heals my arm and then I move on. Uh, there is it is a very complex um, disease and is a very complex uh, issue and treatment thus needs to be complex. So um, today we're going to be focusing on the biological aspects, right? I already said that. Um, there's a little arrow pointing to the biological. Okay. Now, what is a disease? And I'm moving quickly because this is just to give you um, an understanding of some of the key concepts. Uh, the disease model is, um, or a disease is a disorder of a structure or function in a human, animal, or plant, especially one that has a known cause and a distinctive group of symptoms, signs, or anatomical changes. The biggest thing is there's change that happens to an organ, okay? When we talk about diabetes, it's a disease. At first, now we're talking about the type of diabetes that you get as you grow older, not the one you're born with, okay? At first, it's a choice. It's a series of behavioral um, choices where you have a poor diet. There might be some genetic predis um, predisposing factors in there, but then you make choices to eat a lot of sugars and, and not be healthy in that way. When you do that, your body eventually adapts and it, and it stops making insulin, okay? That is the point where it is no longer a choice because if you were to stop eating sugars at that point, your body will still have changed, okay? So we're gonna talk about how alcoholism or drug or alcohol um, dependence is a disease because there is a change that takes place in the body. And, and if you're wondering which organ um, is primarily impacted with this change, um, <clears throat> you'd be right to think the brain, okay? Now, we're gonna focus in on that today, and that doesn't mean that there's not other changes that take place. But for today, we're really gonna focus on what happens inside the brain when we cross that threshold and our body changes. So this is just a really busy slide I stole from NIDA. <clears throat> um, I borrowed from NIDA. Uh, this illustrates the dopamine and serotonin pathways. Now, this is our reward pleasure pathway um, with dopamine. It looks, it shows you um, reward pleasure. There's some motor functioning, compulsion, um, and then food, memory, processing, sleep, cognition are in the serotonin pathway. So what happens is there's a disruption. Now, dopamine and serotonin are both what we call neurotransmitters. Now, when I start drawing, we're going to be looking at certain neurotransmitters, and I'll explain to you how they work, okay? So we can all be on the same level of understanding. But I just want to show this. This is where the dysfunction starts to happen when we 
um, are drinking or using drugs for an extended period of time and our brain adapts, okay? Um, so the answer, the, the, the question, what about the choice, right? Now, you can see in this diagram, in the beginning, it's this risky substance use. That's where we're making choices, right? We're choosing to binge drink on a, on a Friday night. Uh, we're choosing to drink in the morning because all of our buddies are doing it. And after 15 years of doing that, um, or more, or however many, um, it turns into a disorder, okay, where we're having a lot of behavioral problems, um, might have some um, pretty significant uh, physiological problems too, but eventually it keeps going until you get to this addiction, okay? Once the body has crossed that threshold, um, it will never go back to being normal. Okay, so um, I'm gonna pause right here and then I'm gonna get into some drawing. Um, and unfortunately, I don't know, uh, God's big joke on me was, made me uh, really excited to draw on whiteboards, but he gave me bad handwriting, bad spelling and a horrible drawer. So um, the joke's on me, I know, but uh, stop here. Any questions really fast before I go into the next step? I know I moved quick. No questions? All right. Um, you can also put them in the chat. That's probably the easiest way to communicate uh, with, with me at this point. So, um, all right, so now for my bad drawing, okay? So I'm gonna uh, share, and I'm gonna share this whiteboard. And now uh, those of you that have seen this, um, I'm using this cool little, pen, so apologize for any scribbling. It's about to get uh, scribbly up in here. Um, so we're gonna talk about neurotransmitters, okay? Um, and now these neurotransmitters, your neurons connect um, everything in your brain and every function that happens comes from these, uh, your, let me draw this first. I can't do two things at once. From your neurotransmitters going from neuron to neuron. Okay. So these X's, let's just say those X's are dopamine or serotonin. And the X's are the neurotransmitters. Okay. And this part here, these little squares, these are our receptor sites. Now, whenever we feel something, or our body moves, what happens is a nerve impulse is released and these neurotransmitters cross the synapse and they occupy this receptor site, right? Now, for the sake of this illustration, um, you don't need to know anything about neurons or neurotransmitters, just that the idea is we all have our normal, okay? And for this picture here, there's four neurotransmitters up there, and then there's four receptor sites down here, okay? So this is what our brain looks like when it's feeling pretty normal, okay? Please don't make fun of the writing. It is very difficult to draw on this. <laughs> now, this is a normal person. They're not feeling um, really excited. They're not feeling euphoric. They're also not feeling down or depressed or anxious. They just feel calm, okay? This is homeostasis. Now, that's gonna be a key term because the brain um, wants to maintain homeostasis like this, right? Now, what happens when we decide to go out and have some drinks, okay? So again, this is not 100% um, correct in terms of um, science, like medical, okay? If you're, if you're gonna get your medical degree on this, you'd be wrong. Um, but this is an illustration. So 
let's say I'm going to go out and I'm going to have a few drinks. Now, this is the same thing for, I'm going to say alcohol and drinks, but please, it's for anything that um, we can become addicted to, okay? Insert your substance here. Now, if I go out and I have some drinks, what's going to happen is this. I start with four neurotransmitters, right? But then for the simplicity of this, let's just say each drink is one more neurotransmitter. So now what I'm doing is I'm overloading this system down here um, and I'm firing that neuron longer and harder, uh, which is creating a more euphoric feeling with that substance on board, okay? This is intoxication. All right now, <clears throat> does anybody know uh, what a normie is? What does AA mean by a normie? Anybody? God, I'm going to keep trying to interact with you guys, <laughs> even if it, it kills me here. Uh. Oh, a normie is someone who can drink and use quote unquote normally. Yes. Thank you, Monterey. You're going to be my go-to. Stay right by there. Okay. So this normie goes out on Friday night, gets intoxicated, and then uh, goes to sleep, wakes up Saturday morning, has a hangover, uh, but then doesn't drink again for three weeks. Okay. This cycle here is what a normie's brain looks like when they use, okay? Now, in this zone, you could still have, um, you could still be diagnosed with abuse, okay? Um, or even dependence if the behavioral problems are bad. But in this category, um, and guys, BH means, um, sorry. BH means behavior, okay? So you're gonna be having behavior problems, okay? When we go through this, it can still be a, a big problem, but it's not a physiological problem yet, okay? This is where the threshold theory comes in. Now, this red jagged line that I'm drawing here, this is the threshold, okay? The theoretical threshold. Now, if I continue to drink or use long enough and hard enough, okay? I will eventually cross that threshold. And once I do that, that is the point where everything changes, okay? By the way, that Wu-Tang song just popped in my head. That was the night that everything changed. It doesn't happen that quick, uh, but this is years of drinking or drug use, okay? And now two things are gonna happen when we cross this threshold that take our body to, um, they, they create the change in our brain. The first thing that's gonna happen is the body is going to decrease neurotransmitter production, okay? Um, decrease neurotransmitter production. So let's just say we originally had four. Now it's only gonna make one, okay? And this tends to happen pretty quickly, okay? This is kind of like our acute tolerance. Um, you know, if you were, if somebody were to use substances a lot for a long weekend, their body would start to decrease the neurotransmitter production pretty quickly. Um, so that's not really the one that gets us, okay? The bigger one is this one, number two. It is called upregulation of the receptors. Okay? Now, what that means is if I have, 
if I continue to drink, okay, and to feel normal here, this is my tolerance, right? I'm going to have to drink three drinks in order to fill these four receptors. That's my tolerance. But if I keep doing that, eventually the body is going to upregulate. And what it does is it creates more receptors. I'm going to try and squeeze them all in here. Sorry. Oh, gee, it gets a little crazy with this trying. So it makes more receptors. So now rather than having four, I now have eight. So when I was drinking these three extra drinks just to feel normal, now I'm going to have to drink four more. So in total, I'm drinking seven drinks. And that's just going to make me feel normal. That's where my body is adapted, okay? My brain has created more receptors so that the impact of the alcohol is less or the impact of the drug is less, okay? So when we, oh, sorry. It'd be nice to be able to turn off my alerts. Um, when we cross this threshold, the brain will never go back to being normal, okay? And the brain is doing this to try and maintain homeostasis. Because at this point, we're really drinking way too much, way too often, and we're basically pickling our brain. Now, I told you I'd talk to you about that phrase, once a pickle, always a pickle. So Monterey, okay? Somebody tell me how you make a pickle. Anybody know? You ferment it. And what do you ferment it in? Vinegar. 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 And if you're doing it right, you put a little garlic in there, maybe <laughs> pimentos. Now, yeah. if I were to take, and Monterey, stay, stay live for yeah. a second here. If I were to take a cucumber, right? Because that's what you, you, you take a cucumber and you ferment it in vinegar. If I take that cucumber and I dip it in the vinegar and I pull it out and I rinse it off, is it a cucumber? I mean, yes. is it a pickle? No. no. No, it's still a cucumber. Still a cucumber. Okay, that's your normie, right? They're, they're dipping in the vinegar and then they're rinsing off. Now, in order for me to make that cucumber into a pickle, I have to drop it in the vinegar and I have to let it sit there for a while, okay? When I have it sit there for a while, let me just do this real quick. I'm gonna close that all the way. Um, oops, sorry. All right, I'll do this one. All right. Um, I'm going to close. I'll make it. All right. So I need, to, I need to really soak that cucumber in vinegar in order to make it a pickle. Mm -hmm. That's what happens here. Okay. Now, once the brain becomes a pickle, um, once a cucumber becomes a pickle, will it ever be a cucumber again? No. 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 No, but can it still make a good sandwich? Uh, yes. Yes. And that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about how we get that to that new normal. Okay. So with this, I'm going to give you an example of an oil um, tycoon. Okay. So let's say I had an oil field. And in that oil field, um, I had enough for about four or two pipes of oil to transport to the refinery. And every now and then I get, I strike more oil and I need more um, production, but I don't make more pipes because it happens only so often. Um, but let's say I really hit that big oil field and I know for a fact that I'm gonna have enough oil for generations to come. At that point, <clears throat> I need to invest time, energy and money to make new pipes. 
That's what the brain does, is eventually you continue to flood the system with all of this extra neurotransmitters here for so long. Eventually the brain says, I need more receptors to, to, to deal with all of this, all of these neurotransmitters, okay? Um, now, at this point, the brain invests a lot of energy and a lot of time into creating new receptors, okay? So that's why it happens kind of slowly, but once it happens, you're there, all right? Now, let's say from here, you decide, hey, you know what? Uh, I think I hit rock bottom. Um, I really, uh, I want to go to this really cool place called New Start Recovery. I heard they're awesome. Um, and uh, I'm going to get sober. So the first day that you come here, after you've crossed this threshold, Somebody from Monterey, tell me how many neuro, how many receptor sites do you think you're going to have the first day you come into treatment? Eight. 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 Good. Is that eight? One more, I think. <laughs> eight. Yes. So you're going to have eight. Now, you just stopped drinking, Monterey. So how many neurotransmitters are you going to have? One. One. Yes. Good job. Okay. So if this top one up here was normal, okay, and this one is intoxicated, feeling euphoric or whatever, what is this one going to feel like? Crap. Terrible. <laughs> Terrible, yeah. It's going to feel bad. And what do we call it? Withdrawals. Withdrawals. Good job. This is withdrawal. This is your brain that's acting like, um, anybody remember Seymour from the Little Shop of Horrors? Like, feed me, Seymour, the big the, the plant? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's your brain screaming, feed me. Feed me now. I need this drug because you have used so long and I've adapted to it, how dare you take it away from me? Okay? This is your brain freaking out right now. And it will have all sorts of um, impacts on your physiological systems. Um, you might shake, you might sweat, you might have cravings. Um, there's a lot that goes on here. Okay? Now, those of you, somebody that has had withdrawals, does it stay that bad forever? No. No, no your body changes, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So as we stay sober, okay, the body starts to make some corrections. Because again, remember, the brain wants homeostasis, okay? And the first change that the brain starts to make everybody, is it starts to increase production of our neurotransmitters, okay? So that's number one. It increases neurotransmitters. Now, sometimes the brain structures that create the neurotransmitters get so damaged through our use that we don't go back to what we had normal, okay? Sometimes. Other times, the brain structures are able to rebound to exactly where we were before. Okay, the brain can heal itself, um, but sometimes we, we do too much damage. For most people that I see and work with, I believe that their brain does heal just about back to normal. Now this takes time, okay? Now the neurotransmitter production, again, that's a little quicker. Um, the brain can do that and kind of regulate neurotransmitters a bit quicker, 
the number two one takes longer. And now, um, if we upregulated receptors here, what are we going to do here for these eight receptors? Down. 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 Down regulate. That's right. We're going to down regulate. Now, are we just going to destroy them and just like get rid of them? No. We're all going to cover them up. Why, why not? Because they're there and they're going to wait for more later. Because they're already yeah, just there. Eight. Now there's four. Yeah. So if we go back to my example about the oil tycoon, I invest millions and millions and millions of dollars in time and energy into making more pipes. And all of a sudden I run out of oil for, for uh, a week. I'm not going to tear down all those pipes. I'm, I'm, what am I going to do to them? Might just turn them off, right? Make them dormant. So I might take from this, I'll show you. The brain does not get rid of them. It creates this dormant status for them. Oh, yeah. Mm. Well, that's interesting. Okay? So they're there. There's there below the surface, waiting for what? More substance to more substance. get back in action. Once a pickle, always a pickle. All right. This is why we say the um, addiction is a disease. The brain changes. It upregulates and downregulates. Now, um, go back to this. So I downregulate. receptors. Now, when I do that, these four neurotransmitters fill those four receptor sites. And how am I going to feel here? Better. Normal. Yeah. I like to call this the new normal. Mm. Oh. Things are working and, as they should. And it's a new normal because it, it it's not the same as this normal, is it? No. 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 We've we've changed our bodies. Okay. But okay. it can be a new normal because we're not gonna feel um withdrawals here. Okay. We're not gonna um we're not gonna we're not gonna feel like we did uh in this stage. And we're also not going to feel like we did up here, okay, in this stage. Now, if I were to take this um, drawing here and say to you, what happens when you then drink or relapse? So let's say there's a relapse. I think it brings the receptors back up, I would think. Absolutely. I'm going to make this in red because red is, we're teaching our kids emotions right now. And red is bad. Hmm. Let me relapse. It brings us right back up to here. Okay. One, drink, one drink. Well, I'll tell you, um, yes, it can be that. Um, and it depends on where you are and how reactive your body is. But one, one good episode of drinking, the body will go right back to that. And, and for those of you that have had some sobriety and then relapsed, you can recall that you went right back to where you were. You didn't build back up to, okay, yeah, I just going to have a beer here or there. You probably went right back to drinking as much as you were before, if not more. Has anybody had that experience? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Gradual, but yeah. Yes. It's not gradual. It's not this first part over here where, you know, oh, I'll just have a couple of drinks. Okay. I'll sober up for a little bit. It was not like that. It was green light, here we go. All the receptors say, I know what to do with this. Like, open up, fire them off, let's do it. 
this is this is this is our um this is what we were made for right so even though in this new normal you're feeling pretty good like you're feeling um physiologically okay all right um there still might be cravings there but we can talk about that in a second but the moment you relapse for for a period of time i I, I want to be real. I don't think it's one drink and there you go. It could be one use of a substance and there you go, right? Because all, all substances have different mechanisms of action and they interact with our bodies differently. But overall, when you relapse, it brings you right back up here. Now, for those of you that have been through withdrawal, you know that it's not very fun, okay? Um, and oftentimes, it's, it's one of the hardest things that people go through. The moment you come back to this, you are going to have to make up all of this again, okay? Because there is no way to go from this stage here where your body is um, uh, adapted to having the alcohol and the receptors have been upregulated. There's no way to stay there um, and be sober you will have to go back through this withdrawal. You have to let your body re-regulate and find homeostasis in this new normal in order for you to be able to um, comfortably, safely um, move on in, in your sobriety, okay? So right there, I wanna stop and I just wanna ask um, some, who has questions and, and I, I know Monterey can get on and I can hear them. Um, does anybody else want to, to kind of speak up and tell me what they're thinking or, or ask some questions? No. Monterey, you guys have any questions so far? No, no, not really. really. Hey, Patrick. But there's a question though in the chat. Oh, there's yep. a question in the chat. Yep. Uh, thanks, somebody. Thank you. From Thank Concord. You. Thank you from Concord. <laughs> well, I'm not done yet. Uh, no, we have a question in the chat written out. Okay, what is it? Read it for me. Got you. Put it out there. Oh, I was just curious. Um, what about opiates? Because I. I know a lot of people um, will be sober off of opiates for a while and then go back to the same amount and end up overdosing. They don't yeah. go back to the the same tolerance that they had before. Yeah, yeah, and that's and that that illustrates that this um, this point from the relapse, right, um, isn't like a one time use and you go right back to where you were, right? It's that. You, you think you're, you're, that's kind of the behavioral thing is like, I know I can do this amount. Um, um, do you guys want to turn your uh, camera off for me? Yeah, thanks. Um, it's like, I know I can do this amount. And so um, I'm going to go back and use that amount. And the body isn't back here yet, right? Um, the body is still hopefully in this, in this uh, stage where it's starting to downregulate. Um, but very quickly, the body will readapt, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, it does. Thank you. And we got yeah. another question here at Concord. Sure. Does your body store the drugs in your fat supply and you lose weight and they can put you back in this cycle? Um. Yeah, so so yes, the, the, the quick answer is your um, some substances are stored in fat like THC. Um, and you will right, see right, right. Um, <laughs> what's that? Oh, we're laughing at that. <laughs> yeah, it's true we're though. We're all grabbing our fat. It's it's true. <laughs> and and I've seen this in, in drug tests where the um, somebody who I you guys want to mute real quick while while I answer, uh, but thanks. So so the the fat cells when you work out you burn that and it does release some THC and I've seen drug tests go back up 
um, for that. That is not an excuse for your drug screens to be elevated, by the way, um, since you've been in treatment. They'll be like, I've been doing my push-ups. That's why my THC is through the roof. That's not going to fly. I know Dr. Kakish will not accept that. Um, so, but um, in that case, that kind of illustrates this period of time that it takes um, for your body to really start to downregulate. So if I'm looking at this sober period, um, that's the type of thing that plays into that. Like if my body is still releasing um, cannabinoids, THC, um, for an extended period of time, that's going to decrease um, my, my, uh, my brain's motivation to downregulate. Does that make sense? I need to, my brain needs to feel this sort of pain from the withdrawal in order to actually want to downregulate. Okay. So um, the same thing here, and this is going to be, this is kind of a hard one for people to hear. The more times my body has gone through withdrawal, relapse, withdrawal, relapse, withdrawal, relapse, the slower the brain is to get to the new normal and downregulate. It still will because the brain wants homeostasis, but it knows, it's learned this pattern. And I know I'm personifying the brain right now, but the brain has learned that if I downregulate too quickly, I'm not going to be able to handle the substance when, when we relapse, okay? So I'm not saying the brain is hedging against you, um, but the brain is actually trying to keep you alive. Like that opioid, um, the person taking opiates, trying to keep them alive when they relapse. So the brain doesn't downregulate as quickly. Um, so it's really important that we were patient and calm with ourselves and forgiving of, hey, sometimes it takes a while to get to that new normal um, because we've been through the cycle a few times and the brain um, is, is kind of learning, hey, like, let's see what happens here, okay? Um, but eventually the brain will downregulate. Um, let's go to uh, Bangor. Bangor had a question. Hey, Doc, how you doing? Hey. So uh, my question, and we're going to go back to opiates again. So when I had cancer for years, I was on heavy-duty opiates. I wore fentanyl patches. I had Norco. I had Dilaudid. I had Valium. Sure. I had it all. I had Perks. And when I was done and I was no longer in pain, I did a little Ativan detox and it's been six years and I've never craved or wanted an opiate again. So why is it that if you put one shot of vodka in me, I'm going to pick it up and I'm going to drink it? Yeah. Even so, when I was on opiates, I was drinking. Yeah. So that's a really great question. And, and there's a lot of things with that. Um, the first thing is, it is there is um, each substance interacts with our neurotransmitters in a slightly different way and a slightly different neurotransmitter. Okay. So when we're talking about different substances, it doesn't always translate, but there is always this cross tolerance and cross addiction where the brain learns how to respond to having a flood of neurotransmitters. Okay. So when you, let's say, and I don't know your story um, more than what you just told me, but let's say you never drank before in your life and you had this, um, you had the cancer and you were on the, the, the opiates, um, your brain became physiologically dependent on the opiates like we expect it to when you're treating chronic illness and pain. You did your taper, okay? So the brain went through this process here of upregulating. You did your taper, you went through the withdrawal, but you had some uh, medications to help you. You found this new normal, okay? If you were to go start drinking at that time and, and heavily drink, your brain would do the same thing and go, oh, it's not exactly opiates, but we know this. We know that if I, we know when neurotransmitters are flooding our system, if we make more receptors, we can survive. And we have, and we have, a, a, it has a less of an impact on us so that we could escape from the lion, right? Because that's what our brain wants to do. It wants us to be able to, 
run away from the lion that's hiding in the bushes. Um, and so that's what we call cross tolerance and cross addiction, where the brain will react um, to a new novel substance um, much quicker than, um, you know, because it knows how to react like that. Does that make sense, Bangor? Okay. I'll take your, there you he go. Said, he says yes. Okay. Yes, it does. Thank you. Yeah. So, and, and, and I'll tell you, um, you're talking about cravings, okay? Um, sorry, my spelling and handwriting is horrible. Cravings are not necessarily a part of this. And the reason why is cravings are part of our memory, okay? And um, if you guys remember the movie um, Waterboy, <laughs> okay, I'm probably maybe dating myself here, I don't know. Um, but there's one part of Waterboy where Bobby Boucher, right, um, Adam Sandler, uh, is in the class with Colonel Sanders, okay? Colonel Sanders something, says something about his mother and he freaks out. And uh, Colonel Sanders Sander says there's something wrong with his medulla oblongata. You guys remember that scene? Pretty good scene. That was factually inaccurate, okay? It was his amygdala, not his medulla oblongata. I'm kind of a nerd like that. When I saw that, I was like, no, that's wrong, Colonel. Um, his amygdala is the part of the brain that connects a memory with an emotion. And it squishes them together and then it puts it in the back of our brain. So when we show somebody who's been addicted to cocaine, uh, a picture of uh, a bunny rabbit, okay? A brown bunny rabbit, not a white one. Uh, a brown bunny rabbit, their amygdala is not firing, okay? On a CAT scan or a PET scan, you could see it's, it's, not, it's not firing off. It's not sending um, neurotransmitters through the body. If you were to show that person cocaine, the amygdala would instantly fire off and, and you can see it so pronounced. And, and that is gonna be sending a flood of emotional memories through this person. So what we're talking about here is the physiological changes in our brain, um, not necessarily the memories and emotions that have been consolidated in response to the substance. That's where our cravings come in. And the cravings last much longer. Um, think of, think of your, the very first um, boyfriend or girlfriend you had in your life, the person that you're, your first kiss. Now, granted, if it was a good first kiss, right? Um, you still get a little smile and you still have a little firing of the amygdala, like, oh, that was nice. Um, that, that's what a craving is, is no matter how far down the road you go, something might trigger that part of your brain and it will fire off automatically and, and give you these feelings of, I need a drink. I need a drug use. Uh, I need something. Um, and so something to remember when you have a craving like that, that's not you. Um, that is your past that has been consolidated chemically, because these are all chemicals. So a neurochemical has consolidated this to some positive emotion. Um, and, um, and you have the choice whether or not to respond to it. But acknowledging, hey, this craving just popped in, uh, my amygdala is uh, firing off right now, um, is a really nice way to, to kind of calm yourself down with the cravings. Um, I know that we weren't talking about cravings necessarily, but that's kind of a good tidbit. Monterey, you have a question? Yes. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> what role does the prefrontal cortex play on addiction? Woo! Are you, are you a, uh, a neuroscientist? I didn't know I had a neuroscientist in the house. Um, um, great question. <laughs> um, prefrontal cortex is the part of our brain that makes decisions, really. It's the rational part of our brain. Now, um, I would say that when we're in this stage here where the brain is adapted, the prefrontal cortex is pretty um, out of the picture, right? Um, if we go back to that diagram where I say, in the beginning, it's about choice, okay? That's your prefrontal cortex. That's the part of your brain that's like, yeah, 
those guys are getting way too drunk. I don't really want to hang out with them. I'm just going to have a sip of this and go to bed. Prefrontal cortex, making decisions, impulse control, rational, um, high-level thinking. That goes right out the window uh, when we start using substances. And, and it really, um, our brains go more into this survival mode of, I just need to survive this influx of chemical in my body. Uh, how do I do it? They're not thinking. Um, sometimes you think you're really in your prefrontal cortex, depending on what substance you're on, um, but you're really not. <laughs> it's really in the emotional um, primal part of our brains um, that we're, we're kind of in that state there. Does that make sense? Um, so why is it that because the survival part of our brain is activated, we no longer have access to the decision-making process. Like if we can see that this thing, whatever drink or drug uh, brings us pleasure, why is it that that comes before our survival instincts um, in the mandula oblongata? <laughs> Something wrong with this medulla oblongata. Um, yeah, I don't have a good answer for that other than I think if we're talking about the needs of, of, a, of a being, um, survival is, is by far the, the most important one. And when we have this, there's a lot of reasons, a lot of social reasons, um, if we're talking about the biopsychosocial, there's a lot of social reasons that keep us or give us permission to make bad decisions, okay? So our prefrontal cortex will say something like, hey, I don't think this is the right decision for us. I heard drugs are bad um, on a South Park episode, so I don't wanna, I'm not gonna do drugs. That's prefrontal cortex, but then there's this social pressure or there's this trauma that's happened in our life and, and we start to see the benefits of using a substance. Okay, I take a substance, I don't feel as um, bad about my social anxiety, okay? We in the prefrontal cortex say that's survival, right? We give ourselves permission, we rationalize this behavior. And, and what you're talking about is everything that happens kind of in this, um, in this first stage um, over here, right? Where the prefrontal cortex is really sort of um, being pressured by our circumstances, by our beliefs, and we give ourselves permission, we call those permissive thoughts, to continue with a behavior that we know is not that good for us. Um, those are errors in our thinking um, that have to do with social kind of interactions as well as biological. I mean, we all have predispositions to things. Um, but in this case, um, in this illustration, the prefrontal cortex isn't playing a role at all. Um, this is really just how did the brain adapt, right? Um, and showing kind of each stage. Um, now, the question that I always want to hear, um, and I didn't hear it yet, is, how do we know where my threshold is? So somebody tell me, how do you know where this jagged squiggly line is here? How do you know when you've crossed this threshold or where it's at? What do you guys think? When you can't control your cravings or- um, Physical. Yeah, you, you just- Not just all of a sudden. You need more and more. Need more and more, can't control the cravings. All of those are really good um, guesses and they're pretty darn close. Actually, the threshold, you never know when you cross it. It's no longer pleasurable. Okay, all of those are really good, yes. All of those are good symptoms that are, that. but the only way you know you've crossed the threshold is after you've crossed it. And you try and stop and you go through these withdrawals, okay? That's how you really know that you've crossed this threshold. So it's impossible to say where your threshold or where my threshold is. 
which is why some of you might have had this experience where um, you had a buddy who you used to drink or use with for years. And one day your buddy says, you know what? I think I'm going to stop. And you're like, that's crazy. Um, but then they just stop. Um, and they don't have withdrawals. They don't have big problems. They just stop. Okay. That person hasn't crossed the threshold yet. You try and stop on that same day and you go into this, this full on kind of withdraw um, stage here. Okay. You've already crossed the threshold. Now, this is where our genetics come in. All right. Our genetics play a role in where that threshold is, okay? Now, this is a pop uh, quiz question, all right? And, and I want, um, if anybody can uh, answer this, uh, I'll send them a, a water bottle, okay? Regardless Ooh. of where you are. Oh, look at Concord. I knew Concord would take off the mute. Somebody, <laughs> you guys, hey. You know, James and I got a little competition going. And so I, I see I see you, Concord. What's uh, up? So, <laughs> so listen, the question is this. What is the enzyme that breaks down alcohol called? What is the enzyme that breaks down alcohol? Is it amino acid? Okay, five more seconds. Is it amino acid? Dehydro. I can't pronounce it. No. Read that word. Read that. Can they it is it? alcohol dehydrogenase. Yeah. That's that right. part. That one. So I totally knew it. Yeah, I totally knew that. I know you guys knew it. Um, I'll, I'll tell James that you guys, uh, you guys definitely had the answer almost. Um, so. Uh, the alcohol dehydrogenase enzyme is what breaks down alcohol, okay? Now, when I, um, my genetics determine how much of that alcohol dehydrogenase I have in my system, all right? Now, um, historically, and speaking in general terms, Eastern European descent have more alcohol dehydrogenase enzymes in their stomach and in their liver than non Eastern European descent people, okay? So what that means is I'm Irish Catholic, Irish Italian, right? I could start drinking right now and not stop, not have a hangover, wake up the next morning, go do it again. My, um, my friend from, um, he's, he's Mandarin, so he's Chinese, does not have as much of that enzyme in his body. If he has one drink, he turns bright red, they call it the flushing response, bright red, and he's intoxicated on one drink and he stays intoxicated, and then he has a horrible hangover, okay? Which one of us is more likely to become an alcoholic? The Eastern European person. Yes, yeah. it allows me to drink often, it allows me to drink a lot. Okay, and I don't have the consequences either. So, um, in order to cross the threshold, you really have to have some genes that are predisposing you that give you the ability to drink a lot, drink often, um, and then um, your body adapts to it to kind of keep you alive. Okay. So, what other questions? I threw a lot of information at you, Monterey. What's up? Can a normie become a pickle ever? Yes, absolutely. They just have to work harder at it, right? Um, anybody can become addicted to anything, all right? It's just some people um, might have to try a little bit harder, like my friend who's... Um, who's um, Chinese, has the flushing response, he could become an alcoholic. But it's going to be really hard for him to do that. He's going to have to really struggle through a lot of physiological problems, a lot of social problems. It, it's not as easy for him to do what needs to be done to become an alcoholic. 
Does that make sense? So, um, so this idea of a normie, um, that's kind of a behavioral thing. Uh, if a normie drinks enough or uses a substance, um, they for sure can become uh, addicted to it. Any other questions about um, kind of the changes that happen in our brain as we um, move from being normal, whatever the heck that means, to intoxicated, to repeatedly becoming intoxicated for a long period of time where our brain adapts to the substance, to then um, withdrawing from the substance, creating a new normal, and then possible relapse and going through that cycle again. Any questions about that? Got a question at Concord. At Concord, um, I, I was curious, um, the, the difference between opiate dependent and opiate addiction, um, what that is, uh, and what I mean by that is, um, there are people out there that can take opiates for long periods of time and then all of a sudden stop and be okay. Whereas other people take them for long periods of time and are severely addicted to them. Yeah. And what you're talking about is this threshold theory. Um, is that uh, one person crossed that threshold uh, and the other person may not have. Now, opiates are really interesting because there's two types of people with opiate that take opiate. One type is the person that takes it and feels this euphoria, okay? Mm -hmm. right. And the other type is the person that takes it and is like knocked out and it doesn't feel good for them, okay? <laughs> Hands down, the person who feels euphoria is more likely to become addicted. Yeah. So, so this is where we're talking about our actual brain chemistry that's predisposing us to something, right? It, it's, um, you know, if I take an opiate and I, and I hate the feeling and I get sick to my stomach and I'm out of it, but somebody else takes it and they're cleaning their house and they're taking their kids to school and they're super mom or dad, um, that, that person's more likely to become addicted. Um, and... And there's studies that have been done on that, but that's kind of like the, the predisposition of our of our chemical makeup uh, that, that kind of sends us down that path. And, and also the threshold theory of, you know, my brain might not have adapted to having that on board yet, whereas the other person's did. And so that's the hard part of like trying to gamble and be a normie with any of this is, you never really know, you know, like at what point have you gone too far uh, until you go too far and you're like, yep, okay, now here I am. And now I'm gonna have to walk through the fire of withdrawal to, to kind of get back to a new normal. Bangor. Hi doc, Josh here at Bangor, how are you? Good, Josh. When you say you can be addicted to anything, the same chemical process and reaction in the brain, can it be something as simple as tobacco or other substances that uh, have the same warning labels on them, but uh, might be a little bit more socially tolerable? Hell yes, Josh. Um, and let's go ahead and throw sex in there. Let's throw shopping in there. Um, let's throw um, <clears throat> all the extreme sports I love to do, okay? Um, all of those things are addictive, all right? Um, I'm going to take this screen off here. Um, I'm going to do a new uh, drawing. So um, what you're talking about though, Josh, is this idea that certain substances will hit like this, right? Um, if you do cocaine, you get high and then you crash, and you usually crash below your, your norm, right? If, if I'm going and using, um, if I'm uh, skydiving, skydiving is kind of like this, right? Um, if I'm, if I'm uh, smoking cigarettes, it's kind of more like this, right? The cigarettes kind of come quick, and then 
but I'm, I'm still not kind of crashing like I would with cocaine. So this is where we're talking about the mechanism of action on the body and how quickly you feel the effects and then how quickly the effects go away. So that's why some substances are way more um, uh, addictive than others. And so I always get this question because I believe in experiential therapies and like, like I want to take people skydiving in recovery, right? Um, and people are like, well, that adrenaline rush, that feel good, the, the dopamine surge, isn't that the same thing? And yes, um, to, to a large degree it is, but it's just not as pronounced and it's more of a natural high. I know that sounds hokey. Um, but it's more of a natural high that that is healthy rather than this massive spike up here than this massive crash. That's what then fires the, the brain to go feed me more. Okay. Um, so yes, our bodies will adapt to all of these things. Um, and so when we talk about moderation in all areas of our life and balance, this is what we're talking about. Um and, you know, the sex addict, the shopping addict, the extreme sports addict. I mean, you could put that word addict or addiction or dependence on anything. Um, so uh, for all of you, I, I really appreciate you coming uh, to, the, to the meeting here. Um, I'm going to pull out of this and I'll, I'll kind of end my uh, rant. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, doctor. We appreciate your time. Yeah, we got a lot out of it over here at Concord. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, very educational. Well, thank you all. Um, and this is Monterey, so um, you know you can always come visit. <laughs> <laughs>